Your power is based on how close you are to the people who have real power. Uh, and you can get caught up in that, and people do. And it's, um, it's destructive. Welcome to Podcast Coaching with Christine. I'm your host, Christine O'Donnell. I'm an Emmy-nominated TV journalist and podcast coach. Each week, I interview someone who has an exceptional story and talent to help independent podcasters grow their shows. Hello, and welcome back to another episode. Today, I am interviewing a pioneer for women in media. She is a glass ceiling breaker and someone who has bravely used her voice to make an impact for women and girls time and time again. She's an Emmy Award winner, an Oscar nominee, a journalist, a war correspondent, the former president of CNN Productions. She is currently the editorial director of TED Women and the chair of the Sundance Institute and the author of Becoming a Dangerous Woman, Embracing Risk to Change the World. Pat Mitchell, thank you so much for being on my show. How are you? I'm good. You have done some huge groundbreaking things. I mean, actually before, like right before we jumped on the call, like I was shaking because I was so nervous to talk with you. And I was like, oh my gosh, I need to get out of my head, right? Because you've just, you've done so much that I just, I, I almost felt like just, out of my out of my element in a way that made me like oh I don't I don't deserve to interview her oh, and that is on. not no. and that's <laughs> not what you're about you're a hundred percent about empowering women and girls to step into who they are stepping into their power and going places that no one has gone before and anyway I just need to stop fangirling so hard so I can look at you <laughs> Well, I must say, it, 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 at my age, uh, fangirls are all welcome, believe me. No, I, I, I adore um, your straightforwardness, Christine, your enthusiasm. It's, it's infectious, and thank you for it very much. But, you know, what you were saying at the beginning about being um, feeling fear mm -hmm. about talking to me is really the opposite of what I mean by dangerous. And sometimes I feel like I need to explain that because when we think dangerous as a concept, we do think someone to be feared. And there are millions of women living in desperate fear uh, for their safety and their well-being all over the world. So I considered using that word very carefully because of the negative uh, connotations and definitions of dangerous. But what I want uh, the takeaway to be from any conversation with me, but certainly from reading the book, is the concept that dangerous is about stepping into your own power, using it for the good of other people, uh, and sharing it. And for me, that's what women are especially good at. So that's why in the book, I also profile a lot of other women who have been on that dangerous journey and who have uh, reached a pl place where they have huge impact on other people's lives. And I, I have read your book, it's amazing. Um, and something that, you know, one of your chapters uh, like really struck, I mean, gosh, so many did, but, uh, but it, you open with falling forward. And you talk about, you know, some, some of the things that you went through growing up and, um, you know, with your, your pregnancy early on um, and, and then balancing becoming a mom with your ambition and trying to do the best both places while also like feeding that like need inside of yourself to do something purposeful. Um, what, uh, I mean, what would you say to women today who are trying to balance all of those things as well? I think balance is one of those um, concepts that just, we're never gonna get it absolutely right. And so we're always struggling to get it right. But I don't know that balance is possible. And I've come to believe now that I don't even want it. I mean, I actually, I like being, as my family likes to describe, over-engaged, over-active. Um, I much prefer that to being 
sitting on the sidelines somewhere, right? Um, so when I, you know, unexpectedly found myself becoming a mother at uh, age 22, um, I didn't have any concept of what that would mean to m the pursuit of my own life at 22. What do you know about what you want and need? I realize now my son and I grew up together. We really did. And I didn't do a lot of things right. And I certainly did not have balance. Uh, we didn't have nannies, you know, we just ran home to try and do everything all at one time. And that is the trap we all get caught in, is trying to do everything, be everything all at the same time. Because we are not given the option, as women often, the, and it is an option men have more often, and that is to stage their lives. You know, they can focus on the work at one time in the day or their lives. And women are trying to focus on everything all at one time because we have those varied responsibilities. What I had wished I had, and I wish now for you and all the other young women listening, um, is to be kinder to myself. I wish I had just realized that this balance I was going for, feeling like I was a good mother and I was pursuing my work with my full capacity and capabilities, um, that I had been kinder about realizing what I was juggling and what I was doing right. Uh, because it's, um, it's a guilt that you feel you're never in the right place at the right time. And that is not healthy for anyone. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't improve the lives of our children. It certainly doesn't improve our lives. I did have this wonderfully wise woman who had five children and who was also the first woman editor of a major, a major newspaper in this country. And she took the job at 60. And I remember saying to her, it's kind of laughable now that I'm 78 that I thought she was old. <laughs> but I remember saying to her, wow, taking a, this kind of big job at this age and at five children. And she, you know, she said to me that wonderful thing, women need to think of our bodies and our lives as seasons. We have seasons, men, men have sort of one season uh, primarily, and that's not being entirely fair to men, but, but women do have real seasons, reasons of, uh, seasons of giving birth and then not and menopause and all the other things that we go through. Um, <laughs> to see them all as just places on the journey and know we can't be in all those places on the journey all at one time. And that would have put my ambitions or aspirations or dreams um, into a different context. And it would have allowed me to be, uh, I think, more joyful about being a mother as well. Gosh, so such a, I mean, such a great point because there is this guilt factor that I think that, I mean, I personally try to overcome it. Um, I, the other day I was talking am, like about ambition, literally last night, actually, I was talking about the word ambition, like it was a bad thing for a woman to be, because I'm ambitious. And a lot of the women that I surround myself by are super ambitious. And I was like, why do I have this stuck in my head that this is a bad thing. Like, why does that make me evil? Like the bad guy in a, sh like a show. And I was like, is, am I Cruella? Like, like what's going on? Right. Like it's almost a socialization that I like, yeah. we, I have to untrain myself because I don't believe it. But then I find myself falling back into that like mm. trap where I like, Oh, don't use that a word. Well, it, there are a lot of those words that uh, dog us all the way through our lives because they're words that we didn't put all those connotations around it, but society and culture has, mm -hmm. and it's you know different in different cultures and places, but um, we have to own those words and own those concepts in a different way. And it's not, it's definitely not easy and you don't, you can't just wake up one morning and say, I'm gonna be okay about being ambitious. I'm gonna be okay about not being home at five o'clock or not preparing the best dinner or not all the knots in the nose. Um, because we, we have the, the uh, power, again, using that word, to change all of the ways in which we have been socialized and culture has taught us to compete with each other, 
to compare ourselves to each other, to always feel that we haven't quite measured up. There's so many um, sociological studies that prove how this has held us back from achieving our own dreams and full potential. So it is something though that we need to be aware of just as um, black and brown communities have to be aware constantly of the stereotypes and the culturalizations that are put on top of their lives, the narrative that they have to push back and it's struggle like against yeah. all the time. So do women of all colors, shapes, sizes, and everywhere in the world, because there isn't anywhere in the world, Christine, where we are truly equal. Nowhere. There are countries where we are closer to it, a lot closer. The U.S. is not one of them, by the way. We're like 52 on that gender index where other, so that means a lot of countries are far better places to be a woman than, than the U.S. But even with all the progress we've made here and other places, we're still not fully equal in the, in the eyes of the law, which matters, in the eyes of constitutions, which matter, and in the eyes of the, uh, of the cultural narrative that has been created around us and about us, but not often enough by us. So that is where the, that's the lever for change. And that's where we have to focus our energies, our positive thoughts on, um, on changing this, changing the narrative, because we have the power to do that. You know, I, I agree with you. And I think it's about getting out of our own heads. And that's such a push that's, a, and people, we don't like change. Nobody does. I don't, <laughs> I mean, I do because I try to remind myself it's the only thing that I can count on is change. Mm -hmm. So I really should just enjoy it. Um, but then we get comfortable and then we forget that we're supposed to enjoy, at least I'm projecting here, but we forget that we're supposed to enjoy change. Um, well, speaking of, I, I Googled top, top countries to be a woman. And I was thinking in the back of my head, oh, those Vikings, they knew, they knew what was mm -hmm. up. Those, mm -hmm. those women were fierce. And the, that's it. Those are the top countries right there. But Sweden, it's important. Denmark. Yeah. And, and, they, and the Nordic countries and a, and a few other island countries. Um, but it's also important to remember that in indigenous communities all mm. over the world, that was not the narrative about women women were not only fully equal, they were in charge. Yeah. And in indigenous cultures today, all over the world, in Costa Rica, in, um, in many of the island countries, in this country, there are still indigenous communities where they're matriarchal. Mm -hmm. And I love the ones that in the Northeast United States, those tribes, the women not only ran everything, the women were the only ones who could vote they elected the sh the chiefs i mean they were, the men were chiefs but they were elected by the women <laughs> and what you know I, i'm not by the way this sounds like i'm you know uh, playing into that game of if women women win men lose not true yeah, yeah. that that is the game that has kept us on the sidelines way too long uh, but this is for me a, just a recognition that we're different that we bring different skills, attributes, qualities, even values, and certainly we bring lived, different lived experiences to every decision-making table. So some societies chose to put women at those decision-making tables because they valued the uh, certain attributes that women brought to decision-making. Um, so I just like to see more of that around the world, not at the expense of men not being there too, but just uh, for the purpose of fully realizing all of the uh, capacity of women and all of the capacity of men to work together toward problem solving. Absolutely. And I want to, because you, you have kind of touched on this, this theme here, um, that you, you reminded me of, you know, your, your show woman to woman. So this, I mean, you were working with women to produce a show for women that had never been done before. And this was before Oprah. This Way. is, this is the Oprah before Oprah show. 
like Pat, like it's, it's an amazing story what you had done there. And, and, and anyone listening, please, please, Becoming a Dangerous Woman, it is an amazing book. And one of the things that you talk about that I think is so valuable is that power struggle. Like once, once people wanted to come in and kind of take this amazing thing away, and, and and it was like, do we fund it? How do we fund it? What do we what do we do? And I think something you mentioned is like, I, I would have done it differently had I known more. And I yeah. felt like it was such like I was so like lucky to read this book because now I have like your lived experience in my mind. Like, thank thank goodness every woman who's in media should read this book to understand like the power dynamics and what it takes to pitch yourself to people and to get funding for these projects and and to work with other women in the way that you did. I mean, do you want to talk about that experience? And, and I, cause I also think podcasters could totally learn from that as well. Well, yeah, I, I really appreciate your bringing that particular story forward. And by the way, it's worth mentioning that this is the way women learn and the way we connect and the way that we move forward is by, <clears throat> excuse me, it's by sharing our stories. Because in our stories, we see all the commonalities of the struggles and of the challenges. So I shared that story among others in the book because I think it's apocryphal. Um, here we were, my partner and myself, another woman who I worked with, we had a big idea. Let's produce a television show for women that is produced by women, by the way, and hosted by a woman, um, in this case, me. And uh, everybody went, that's crazy. Women aren't going to watch that. Women will not watch a show called Woman to Woman. I'm like, what? No, women only want their game shows with their, their smiley white male host and soap operas. Well, nobody had ever asked them. They just didn't have any options at that in the early 80s. So we would go to try and sell the show to a male uh, general manager of a television network. And he would say, no, 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 nobody will watch a show. Women don't want that kind of television. And I'd say, take it home to your wife. Let her take a look at it. Are you a girlfriend? Are you just any woman in your life? Just show it to her. And every time they did that, he would come back and go, you know, you're right. They loved it. They saw themselves there. They said, wow, that's me. That's my story. So the show not only went on the air, it won the Emmy as the best daytime television show. Uh, we had a huge audience of women grateful that there was an hour every day where they could actually hear other women telling their stories and sharing their life experiences, their challenges, as well as their accomplishments. Oprah Winfrey at the time was a local television show in Chicago. We were the national show and she, was, she would be the lead in to our show. So that's how we got to know each other as she was promoting my show and I was promoting her in Chicago. But the thing we didn't do right, we did everything else right. We got it on the air, we sold the show, we had a staff of 80 women, half of whom had babies. We had on-site daycare because I wanted them to be with their children and not be separated. We had everything going, except we didn't figure out the financial um, possibilities. And the financial part of our lives was managed by a group of men who did understand what the opportunity was. So they sold the show. They sold the company out from under us. And we had less than a month to try and refinance and keep the program on the air. And neither Mary nor myself knew enough about what our deal was, knew enough about what our opportunities were, what our choices and options were, and therefore we made a quick and easy decision, easy meaning it could happen right away, to sell the, the show back to NBC Network where we had both worked before. But in doing so, we gave up all the rights to everything. So for people who are starting out in business, women entrepreneurs in particular, so much, you're all so much better informed and I'm so much better informed now but it's a, you have to know every part of your business 
every every part you can't delegate something to to someone else it's really important to be to feel informed and to feel in charge so there's much more i could say about that yeah. but um but the lesson for me there was the next time you set up your own company you're going to know you're going to do it with financing that you arrange me me and um and you'll be much more in control of the future of what happens to it uh, that story didn't turn out badly because oprah then took our time slots uh that we had and became the oprah winfrey show nationally and made television history which so that's a good thing and then i went on to have a really interesting career as an executive too so um i've got i'm not reliving the past because I regret anything, I'm reliving the story because there are lessons there for other people who are starting out in their own businesses. Um, absolutely. And I feel like, and something that I just connect to so much here is because like I identify as a journalist, I identify as a storyteller, I wanna support other women. Um, and and so as I, I was reading about this and then like this heavy, like idea of understanding the financial background of my business and like getting funding for different projects like it's such an uncomfortable place for me to go because i don't understand it and part of me just doesn't want to understand it and i think that that's not fair to me i'm not giving myself enough credit where i can absolutely understand it i just well, putting it off. Yeah. Well, look, and... here, here's the point, Christine. We can't yeah. be experts in everything. <laughs> yeah, true. I will never be a financial expert. I will never play the market. I won't. I mean, it's just not of interest enough to me, mm -hmm. frankly. Um, but give yourself, you know, some room. So find the right people, people yeah, that you yeah. trust. It just it's part of surrounding ourselves with people that we trust. I do think that finance is sort of the last frontier of feminism. You know, we really do have to kind of conquer the complete understanding or enough understanding uh, to be in, in as much um, control of that part of our lives as we are in all. In all. And we know women aren't because uh, they're so uh, still facing the challenge of financial uh, inequity everywhere in almost every situation. But I'll just tell you a funny other story. I got invited to be on the Bank of America board, my first corporate board, the Bank of America, the largest bank in the in this country, maybe the world at that point. And I said to the CEO who, who wanted me to be on the board because I was the president of PBS and he wanted a media person and a media person beyond reproach, you know, PBS. Um, and I said, I don't know the first thing about banking. And I even told him my story about woman to woman. And he said, well, I'll get you a financial tutor. And he did. So for the whole time I was on the Bank of America board, I had a financial tutor who sat with me every week or so and would go through all the materials that I needed to understand. Now he didn't teach me how to be a banker. That wasn't the point. He taught me how to know enough to make the right decisions as a board member. So there are ways, you know, for us to conquer these fears that don't have to do with uh, making ourselves feel badly because we don't get it all totally. Um, there's that other great thing about women is that when we apply for a job, we think we have to tick every single box. Oh, well, I only have three years experience, not five, so I better not apply. <laughs> do you know that men never ever think about that? according to all the studies that have been done among job recruiting organizations, <laughs> men don't look at the boxes because they assume whatever the boxes indicate, they can learn it, mm -hmm. they can do it. So the more, the thing I encourage us all as women to do more of is to learn by doing. To just say, no, I don't know how to do a podcast company. I don't know how to interview people. You know, all the things that are the no's in front of you, push them aside and know that you can learn anything you need to know how to do, except maybe brain surgery. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't want you to learn by doing <laughs> there, uh, but we can learn by doing. Yeah. And, uh, and that's the risk taking that is necessary if we're going to move forward. 
that risk taking. So I, so I love this idea where we're going. Cause I feel like so many podcasters when they step into, Hey, and that I'm going to, I'm going to produce a podcast and I'm going to put it out there in the world. And, and maybe it'll be something that can make me money someday, or, or maybe it'll change somebody's life if they hear it, or maybe I'll actually make an impact by sharing my story. And, and, and then they tell somebody in their family or their friends, and they're like, a podcast, what's a podcast? Is that really that, like the smartest thing for you to do? And, and, and then, and then that can make somebody doubt themselves and, mm -hmm. and think, oh, wait, maybe this isn't a smart risk um, right. for me. And, and, and I do believe that every podcast should have some, you know, strategy like behind it to understand, like that's paired with your, why are you doing it this? And what is your strategy for it? However, I also believe that at, like, at everyone can podcast. It's just figuring out the why and what the strategy is. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on someone who, who's starting to maybe doubt whether or not doing something with purpose or doing something to hopefully make an impact in someone else's life? Like, is that a valuable use of someone's time? I can't think of anything more useful than pursuing with passion something you feel so strongly about you want to sit down and do it every day or every opportunity you get and to pursue that kind of passionate interest or commitment and then to do that with a purpose which is the way i've always thought about podcasts you know podcasts are at their best great conversations they just you want to drop in you want to eavesdrop and you want to hear every word and that's what makes podcasts special they are also often informative and, and some podcasts you go to directly for real concrete specific information i've done that a lot during this pandemic to get from experts but then there's some podcast i go to just because it's a great story there i know i'm going to hear interesting stories and there's nothing more compelling day in and day out uh, than good storytelling. So podcasts take, for me, the best of the, the format of storytelling because they allow for relaxed, intimate conversation, one to one. And to be able to hear someone's thoughts and ideas and reflections in that kind of intimate environment but to do it with sometimes more than the purpose of just sharing a story although that's a good enough purpose as far as i'm concerned but to do it with the purpose of sharing information or guiding someone somewhere or you know in their own life's journey uh it's it's a wonderful thing to be able to do i always loved radio christine uh, and i worked in radio in my early days in media and even though I had this big television job, people would say to me, why are you going over there to that dinky little radio station and doing drive time radio uh, when you, you have this big television job? And I was like, yeah, but I love that radio environment because I felt more intimate. It felt more like uh, I was being listened to. You are being listened to. Uh, and what a what a great thing that is to be able to communicate information and storytelling in that way. So what has been one of your favorite podcasts to listen to in the pandemic? Oh, dear. I knew you were going to ask me that. And I never remember the names of podcasts. I mean, I listen to to the daily like everybody else in the world um, or many people in the world, because I find that he he always takes a subject and good dives very deep mm. uh, into it in ways that um, I enjoy. And I've listened to, oh, what is it called? See, I, I can't think of any of the names okay. of them now that It'll you've asked you. me, especially not with today with my scrambled mind. But, um, and, and then there's a podcast out of London with a scientist that my husband and I both admire a lot. Um, and so we listen to him on a regular basis. Um, I keep NPR on in my car and in my um, bathroom constantly uh, when I'm doing things around the house. So that's whatever podcaster I'm just on. I subscribe to all of them. So, 
something that you mentioned in your book, and it's when you're interviewing Christian Amanpour, and I know you recently re- interviewed her again for your new show. Yes, Got I did. a digital, <laughs> digital show. Yes, she was the first one to do the FinTech series with me. Yes. Um, something you guys talk about is journalists getting too involved. Mm. Um, and if that's really a thing, how it's the difference between daring enough to be truthful rather than neutral. And, mm-hmm. and the quote goes on to say, um, our profession's golden rule of objectivity does not mean drawing a false moral equivalent equivalence between aggressor and victim. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Christine, I'd love to dive uh, into that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a very, um, it's a very important point actually about, journalist, and in particular today, when there doesn't seem to be anything uh, that's close to objectivity, because journalism has become like everything else, sort of politicized in ways that are toxic and negative. Our, our journalists have become advocates for points of view. But I think what Christine, Christiana, is, uh, Christiana, Christiana is referring to there is when she reported on the Bosnian War, with such passion and uh, as she revealed to the world for the first time the atrocities uh, of that war, she wasn't being objective. She was saying, this is horrific, what is happening here. And she did it with a kind of passion that some people interpreted, I think, as advocacy for one side or the other. And uh, criticized her for not being objective. Um, I'm just remembering this was part of what she talked to me about then because we were working together at that time. So, um, but I don't think she's saying, I don't think she's saying that it's okay for journalists to be partisan. That's not the same as being engaged and passionate and truthful. And truth is the big word here. Uh, what she's saying is if telling the truth is what's important, not, um, not the importance of, of being or seeming to be objective about the truth. Truth isn't subjective, you know. It, truth, it, we forgot that during the four years of our last president. Uh, tr- truth actually is an absolute. <laughs> yes. So, so I don't want to speak for Christiane and how she might be thinking about that because she says it so beautifully there. But I do remember the early days of her reporting from the front lines of war. And I ran into it constantly in my reporting. I was always told, oh, you're playing the women's card. You're always speaking up and advocating for women. And yes, I was, because often their points of view were not being presented without some sort of fervent advocacy, um, but, but, but there was truth too and what I wanted to report about them. Yeah, I just, I think that's such an important point and it is so like murky, such a murky yeah. area it that is. it's like it's hard to talk about. Um, I, I find myself having conversations with people about like journalism and objectivity and, and what happens if a journalist gets too close to a story so much that they have a feeling about it. Because I would also argue, is it, are you, aren't we human? Like I, I, humanity is such a huge part of storytelling and yeah. of journalism. So maybe it's more truthful to be truthful about how you're feeling about what you're talking about yeah whether like so being honest about your feelings while also sharing the truth of the story it's like this weird balance that i think that uh, but we're un- uncovering we're in a really weird time i think for journalists and, and and i would actually argue that a lot of local journalists try really hard to be as objective as possible with their storytelling where it becomes way more political um the higher up you go and mm-hmm. and, and you do make that yeah that national stage yeah it, it it is a difficult time for journalism because as i said we've lost respect for the truth mm-hmm. uh truth has become uh out of the mouths of which partisan is saying it um all you have to do is look at the fact that 
70 percent of the republicans in this country right now don't believe we have a legitimate president who still believe the election was unfair um well you know there's just facts about that and facts are you know are a kind of truth uh so uh and for journalists who are trying to cover things object yes they they do there's a difference too between being objective and giving all sides of a story mm -hmm. and it isn't two sides there are all kinds of sides to the story so it is a journalist's responsibility in my opinion to give as much of the full 360 degree view on any subject or issue or situation yeah. but to do it without emotion and maybe this is what christiana's getting at um that that's first of all not possible because we all do have emotional responses uh, to things uh, and rightly so. Um, so it, it, it is a very thin line and it again comes back to that word balance, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and we have been out of balance mm -hmm. on that side, particularly in the news media, which had, has become so partisan and so political that it is hard to find fact and truth in all of that. Um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's an issue worthy of several other podcasts. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> speaking of, you know, politics, you worked in Washington, DC, and you've got a chapter in your book playing the power game. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I feel like I learned, like I just, I learned from listening to the different power dynamics that you experienced showing up in these rooms that, um, where people may have wanted something from you and, and and it's really easy to like want to be like oh i'm here cuz i'm so amazing and people love me and i'm on a tv show like at least i've i've felt that way before being a tv news reporter in los angeles and all of a sudden people treat you like more special and you think oh mm -hmm. wow maybe like there is something more special about me but wait why was i really invited to this party right and right. i love how you ask those questions of yourself like so well, important. In Washington, uh, Christine, you have to really ask yourself that question constantly about power because everything in that city is so motivated by what power someone has and whether it's real or mm -hmm. perceived and half the time it isn't real. But there is real power there too. You know, el elected people have real power and the press has real power. Um, so hosting a, a show that was also a news and information program yeah i had a sphere of influence did i have power to make things change or happen uh i i i did struggle with that concept because it is a town where everything is focused on power so is los angeles as i mentioned in in the book too because i moved from dc to la and i found the similarities astonishing that <laughs> just it's a different power base but both towns are one industry towns, Washington politics, LA film and entertainment business, um, but they're based on how close you are. Your power is based on how close you are to the people who have real power. Um, and you can get caught up in that and people do. And it's, um, it's destructive and it's, it's deceptive too, because it can, it can make you feel that you, you know, you have a kind of influence you don't have, but it can also make you feel that you're not, or, or lead you to diminish the influence that you actually do have. So power is, is like everything else we're talking about, a tricky balance, <laughs> but it's so important to recognize that we all have it, that every person in every room has a certain degree of it, uh, and that, how we use it is what matters it isn't how much we have or how close we are to the source of power in that room or in that city or town um, it's what are we doing with the influence that we do have yeah more looking within mm. instead of who we're standing next to yes exactly yeah that's yeah that is powerful i think once you even just start thinking about that right um and time is powerful in our lives and I'm running out of it. I'm so sorry uh, <laughs> that I am going to have to, uh, to close this in just a few minutes. And it's so hard to do because I'm really enjoying 
a very thought provoking conversation, which is the very best thing that podcasts can do too. Um, when I listen to one, I always say, am I, am I still thinking an hour or so later <laughs> uh, or maybe the next day? And I often am. And sometimes, as, as you've noticed, I can't even tell you what particular podcast it was, but it was something I heard. And there is still for me something about hearing it as opposed to the visual thing of seeing and hearing, which I also, of course, uh, want in my life. But I am a big believer in, uh, in these kind of intimate conversations, whether they're only on audio or whether you have the opportunity to have both. But we need more of this. We need more of this now, probably more than ever, because we're all navigating through the end of this unprecedented time to what's next. And what's next, by the way, uh, is the theme for this year's TED Women. So I Tell should me just mention it. that uh, we, we thought, what can we do at TED Women that will kind of give us, will give us a platform for looking at what's next in our lives? What's next in technology? What's next in podcast and television and film and writing and politics and uh, what, science discovery. So uh, I'll have to come back and talk about that a, another time. Podcasters out there for sure would love to be a speaker at TED Women, at TEDx, at any TED event. If there's a podcaster listening who's like, how do I do that? Pat, do you have advice for them? Well, there is a, a place on the TED.com website where you can self-nominate yourself. And those names do go in to the pool of considerations. The TED conferences have several different sets of curators. So depending on where the idea sort of fits, that group of curators will look at it. Um, and then there, you know, for TED women, we specifically focus on women, as you know, um, and I'm happy to, to review or at least send to, I don't do this by myself, there are 10 curators. Um, but the, the best thing is to either self-nominate or get someone to go on TED.com and, and nominate you. Say, this is my favorite podcaster, or I think I want to hear more from this um, host or person. Yeah, that's a, that's yeah. a great, a yeah, great a, idea an amazing number of people end up. up on the stage who have self nominated or been nominated, because it's really about the uniqueness of the idea. Before you nominate yourself or have someone nominate you just think this, what will be the takeaway of my 10 minutes or 12 minutes on stage? What will my TED talk really be about? And that's because that's what the TED team will ask. What will the audience be left with? What will they walk away from this TED Talk thinking, believing, feeling, thinking about? Uh, it's the impact of the talk. Absolutely. Pat, thank you for making such an impact on this podcast, uh -huh. on me. Thank you for being a part of this show. And I wish you luck with whatever you have next <laughs> today. I know you've got a lot of big stuff happening. So... Uh, thank you again for being on my show. Well, thank you for understanding. And since I, I think I have a couple of minutes I didn't use, you'll just we'll just add them on to the next one, I hope. <laughs> for sure we will. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, you so Christine. Much. And that's a wrap. Thank you for listening to another episode of Podcast Coaching with Christine. For more information on this week's episode, be sure to check the show notes. You can also find more information on my website, christine-odonnell.com. There's a bunch of resources over there as well and more information about my community if you would like to join it. Again, that's christine-odonnell.com. If this podcast helped you in any way, please let me know. You can always screenshot that you've listened to this episode and then share it in your stories and tag me on Instagram. I am happy to reshare your story and, and let more people know about what you're doing, your podcast. Thank you again for listening and I will see you next time.